we're starting again another UNED Voice Lab Live. Today, once again, with Dr. Philippe Alain and our special guest, the Professor Matthias Heldner. And Professor Matthias Heldner is Professor of Phonetics director of the phonetics laboratory and head of the department of linguistics at the Stockholm University. And as a director of the phonetics lab, he has developed recording facilities for breathing movements and voice quality dynamics in conversation, as well as more general facilities for capturing acoustic and physiological signal signals with a very high level of experimental control Welcome, Professor Matthias Hedner. Welcome, thank you so much. Thank you for having me here. Oh, it is an honor for us to have you here today Completely. talking about what you do and uh, uh, um, about yourself. Actually, we would like to start by that, by asking you how did you become a phonetician and a linguistic interested also in voice and, and uh, the communication aspect of it? Well, well, um, I think there are, um, I think there are many sides to, to this answer, but, but <laughs> I guess one important reason why I'm a I am a phonetician now is that when when I was a teenager and played in in various bands I was really fascinated by the vocoder or speech synthesis vocals of of some um, of the of the German band Kraftwerk that that they used so then I decided I I have to become uh, some kind of engineer and um, mm -hmm work on, on speech synthesis so that I can also use that in, in, in for music. And that, that's, uh, that, that's one reason. And, and uh, I never became an, uh, a speech synthesis engineer, but, but after a while, I, I sort of understood that, that maybe phonetics is useful for, for speech synthesis as well. So, so that's one of the paths, um, but but there are others as well, I would say. I think also with this music interest, when I came into the phonetics lab at Umeå University, where I was then, and, and saw the, their studio and the, the microphones and, and other things they had, I, 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 uh, I understood that there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, possibilities for for doing music in the studio as well. So, so music music is one side. Uh, language studies was another. I I think I first came in contact with phonetics when when I was studying French a long time ago. So, so that's where I I first learned about phonetic transcription and, and articulatory phonetics and and things like that. So. But then also I, I like I like being a researcher. I, I like investigating things. And I think phonetics is great in that sense that, that you can, I mean, you, you study something that's that's very important to, to many people and, and you can make it, make it as cross disciplinary as, as you want. Uh, and that's also something I, I really like about this subject. So, yeah, that's that's uh, at least part of the of the of the answer. I think. <laughs> then, then there are coincidences, and well, well, the three of us have here one thing in common: music and a language and communication. It's uh, the background of, that unites uh, many uh, perspectives uh, of um, of things in life, including um, phonetics and linguistics, but also singing. As you know, we are yeah, yeah. singers. Yeah. Wonderful. We, we we all started through music. <laughs> That's, yeah, it's fantastic, and. Uh, so you studied voice, speech, language, and communication, started uh, from music, and from all these fields of research, in which one you have in uh, you have been 
you have been involved, which one uh, fascinates you most? If there, if there is one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, uh, the the voice things we are doing now. Um, I think that that also comes from from music. I, I mean, I've, I've been uh, interested in 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 uh, the voices of, of singers and 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 so on for for a very long time. And and by now doing measurements and and uh, calculating features, I I feel that I'm getting closer to to this side. So so voices. Well, I guess that that that's the part that, that has most to do with the the music side of it, um, the the communication and turn taking stuff that that we've been doing. That's <clears throat> well, uh, well, uh, at least that doesn't come from from music, but but it's um, I think it's it has been a, a really good area to do research in and. Um, for, for many reasons. Uh, one is that, well, it's a very central part of, of human communication to, to handle turn-taking, but, but it's, also, it's also a phenomena that's so easy to, to capture. And you, need, you need a couple of speakers, you might need a couple of microphones, and then you're recording useful data. And, and um, that's, that's also something I'm, that, for, those, for those who are hearing us and, and do not know what is turn-taking, could you explain a little bit more about it? Yeah, sure. I mean, when, when we're talking, uh, and, and if, well, if, you, if you look at a, at a conversation of some kind from, from the outside, you will notice that sometimes one of the participants is speaking and then some other speaker is speaking and and the, the word is, or the the floor, the conversational floor moves back and forth between those uh, between the participants in the conversation. And uh, um, what what you will also notice fairly quickly is that there's there's some kind of system to 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 this. It's it's not people don't speak. At the same time, for very long periods, and uh, there seemed to be some kind of regulation of of the conversational floor. But how this how this um, managing of turn taking how that happens that that's still something where we don't really know what it, what it, uh, how it's working, so to speak. So. So far, what, what you uh, discovered that is the most uh, responsible for those uh, turn takings? I mean, is it the breathing? Is it the brain? Uh, is it a combination <laughs> of both? Is it the, the language and the culture? I, I, I think there are lots and lots of parallel strands of, of information there. And, and of course, what, what is being said in the conversation, that's that's probably a, a very important part of this. We often know how people are going to end what mm. they have started saying. And, uh, and then we sort of guess that this might be a good place to <laughs> jump into the conversation. Maybe some body language also. Yeah, this body language, eye gaze, um, this prosodic things going into it, uh, um, like more use of non-modal voice at, at the end of, of turns. Um, we see patterns in, in breathing behavior that, especially things like if you, if you stop talking and then, then uh, immediately inhale, well then that, that's a, a fairly strong signal that, that you're going to continue after the pause, for yeah. example. So breathing has to do with it, but, but uh, wording, uh, tempo, well, a lot of things. A lot of things. And, <laughs> and do you do you believe that with the the use of face masks and the pandemic, uh, did that interfere with the uh, uh, turn taking? Uh, because there's lots of cues that are covered. Um, 
I, what I, is your opinion about that? I, I, I think so. I mean, not seeing the, the mouth uh, and, and also that actually the sound is, <laughs> is, is worse in, through a face mask. But, but I think you hide a, uh, half, of your, half of your face in a face mask and, and, and that must have some um, influence on, on this. So I don't know, but may, maybe conversations will be less uh, fluent with with face masks. That's well. That that's that's a question that that could easily be answered in in some student student project, per, perhaps. Perhaps it will be good. Well, um, me personally, I I come across many times asking people to repeat what they said because I don't I didn't understand <laughs> oh. so much of the speech in the consonants is cut by the masks that I really don't understand what sometimes people say. No, and, and lip those... reading lip reading is is lost and uh, mm. mm -hmm. uh, lots of lots of information. So. And the turn taking into uh, no long in an online conversation like this one is much more confused. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that, yeah, that, that's that's another that's an another interesting thing. I mean, in in a in a Zoom call like like this, even though we don't notice it all the time, there are these uh, delays in in the transmission. So mm -hmm. so um, when. Well, when I stop speaking, it 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 takes a while before you hear that that I've stopped speaking. So your responses will be slightly delayed, and uh, and uh, and also since this delay is varying with time, it's very difficult to adjust to it in in any sensible way. So. So, we are changing our our lives with this pandemic because teaching online all the time and uh, all these things uh, really changed our patterns of communication. It will be nice to study it retrospectively mm -hmm. and and look at these recordings and see what is going on with with our conversation. Before I I handled uh, the next question to Mauro, I was going to ask you. You talked about synthesis. So um, in the field of synthesized speech for human interactions with techno and human interactions with technology, in your opinion, what, what is the most difficult challenge when synthesizing the human voice? I mean, uh, some, some parts, it, it's, not, it's not that hard to understand what, what a, a speech synthesizer is saying these days. So the, yeah, so, so understanding it, that, that's, that's okay, I think. The, what is not there and what I think is something that's still quite far away is the, the feeling that the, the machine or the robot or whatever, the dialogue system or, or whatever machine or computer you're talking to, that, that, it's, that, that it is um, sort of alive and understanding what, what it's saying. So I think having having um, having a, a conversation with with a computer and getting this feeling that I'm getting feedback. I'm, I'm um, sometimes the computer likes what I says, uh, <laughs> and and well, those those things that that's something that's something we still cannot do. I think, and but and and also even if, even if it's even if it's uh, fairly good, there, there will come part. Uh, um, there will come a time in, in in that conversation where where the the stress is is on the wrong word in the sentence, or and then then suddenly this um, image you might have of of speaking to a live uh, entity is is ruined, and and you're you realize that yet that you're speaking to me, to a machine, so. So something along along those lines to make it sound human like and human like enough for for us to behave as when we're speaking to other people. So so emotions, do you think they are there? I mean, you you could uh, you could 
put them into the speech synthesizer then if they are used in in the in the appropriate on the appropriate uh, place or or not that that's yeah that that's um, probably also something that is is not too too close in mm. development <laughs> but but I mean, I've heard examples of people making really angry synthesizers or, <laughs> or well, screaming synthesizers and, and things like that. That's, so they, they can convey emotions. I mean, that, that depends on what, what kind of material you input to the, to the synthesizer. But, but uh, modulating or... or uh, Modulating emotions in synthesis, that, that's, uh, I haven't seen anybody who's able to do that in, in a, in a reasonable way, way. way. No, no. <laughs> convincing yet, way. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine the thing, a singer's synthesis, a synthesis is even more complicated because in there, there's even more parameters that change all the time, right? Yeah. So, that's why we hear this. Well, I mean, there is an incredible synthesizer of a singer made by Svante Grangfist's mother, but yeah. you can see that it's a synthesizer ma machine. It's not a singer. So, yeah. yeah. Well, Would it good? Uh, yeah, uh, I know you, uh, you've made a lot of uh, research on breathing, and we're going to talk a lot about it. But uh, prior to it, you mentioned uh, you are you are studying uh, voice now. Could you give us some spoilers <laughs> of what are you studying, or we we need to wait wait for it? <laughs> no, no, but but uh, I mean, um, we have been working. I'm working a lot together with with a colleague here called Martin Wodarczak. And and he's he's uh, heading a project where Johan Sundberg has also been, uh, well, on the staff. Uh, and uh, what we've been doing there uh, lately has been um, exploring a throat microphone or a contact microphone that we glue. Uh, somewhere on outside the, the windpipe and below the level of the glottis. And this signal gives us something where, where the influence of the vocal tract is, is um, practically absent. So, so it's much closer to the voice source than, than uh, the signal you pick up with a, a normal microphone after sound has traveled through the mouth, sort of. And that's... That's um, well. We've mostly been doing method studies with with this uh, lately. But but what we want to be able to use it for is to look at do we do we use things like um, falling into creaky voice or um, breathy voice and so fairly um, short term uh, changes in. In voice quality are those used for communicative purposes so can you use do you use press voice pressed voice for for making a syllable more prominent yeah. do you use breathy voice to, to end an utterance those kinds of, of things so we want to look at short time changes in in um, in voice quality sort of and and we want to do this from from this contact microphone and um, calculate various uh, acoustic features from based on that signal where i mean if if we want to do something like spectral slope of the of the signal then then there's a lot of problems if you have four months varying all the time but but if we use this signal from from the accelerometer uh, then that sound is is uh, well has no uh, vocal tract formants. Mm -hmm. It has a couple of resonances from from the the lungs, but but those resonances stay at in the same place all the time. So th those are much easier to to handle when when uh, designing some kind of 
of uh, acoustic measures to describe uh, the signal. But what we have been doing is comparing the usefulness of, of this accelerometer to normal microphone signals. And also U1 has been doing a lot of manual inverse filtering of, of the microphone signals to see if, if that is, is really a, a better representation of the voice source than, than, the, than the signal we pick up from, from the accelerometer. So in many ways, I mean, we, we got the idea from, from uh, Darius Mehta and, and Bob Hillman and those in, in, in the States. But uh, but it's it's it, yeah it's it's a very it's 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 a very fascinating uh, device to capture voice with I think and and also fairly low cost so do you think it will uh, replace the EGG or um... we don't get exactly the same thing of course uh, and. Uh, I guess it would make a lot of sense to combine e EGG and the throat microphone as well. We haven't done that much since we're still uh, exploring exploring the, yeah. the usefulness of, of this. But but um, one thing Stian Ternström told me about this was that the you get a larger dynamic range for for voice quality variations in from the throat mic than from the EGG since since when when the vocal folds are in contact we don't see what what's happening when they are well that that's something that that um, he um, discovered at some point with uh, Anik Lamarche I think so wow and also comparing to the audio microphone you don't have the the room influence with the reverberations noise and so no and uh, and uh, mm -hmm. since we're we want to go into to uh, record conversations with this we also have no crosstalk at all basically yeah but, exactly so, yeah, yeah. so it's very easy when when uh, our processing chain usually includes some kind of um, voice activity detection and and this this becomes so much easier where where you can be certain that the only sound that's in this uh, on this channel is from from the same speaker so could we say that this will be uh common in uh, on research a common tool to do a common tool to the research yes I, I think so i mean i mean we might find out that that everything that that there's more relevant information in the normal microphone or whatever, or that we have to do manual inverse filtering, you uh, want so very style to <laughs> learn anything about the voice. We, we're not we're not there yet, but I think there's a lot of promise with with the, those contact microphones. So, and and of course you could use them for other things as well. We we have actually used. An older version of, of the contact microphones for recording breathing sounds, and it was fairly easy to to distinguish things like inhalations from exhalations, and uh, and we could also see things like uh, that that um, inhalations before somebody began speaking were louder when picked up from from the throat than than uh, in in uh, other when when they were listening in, in the conversation so i mean they they are useful they they can't be used for for everything but but for voice i think they are very promising and then i mean we we've been buying the same kind of uh, accelerometer components <laughs> as uh, darius and and his team but they are i if i remember correctly i think they are maybe 20 or 25 dollars each so it's it's uh, it's relatively cheap for 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 lab equipment i would say yeah so and since you mentioned breathing <laughs> uh, i can say you have this a lot in the lab here uh with calibration of 
the breeding, the, the risk track and the spirometer and so on. Uh, in general, how well do people breathe? <laughs> I, I can say by my experience in non-singers that people breathe <laughs> terribly. <laughs> do you agree? <laughs> um, I mean, um, maybe maybe I have to say that I'm, I I I um, I've never I've never been in, into any kind of singer training or so I don't I don't know how to sing or how you're supposed to to do this so so it's and and I haven't really studied uh, voice ergonomics mm. or or anything like that and um, but what what I what I do think I mean people breathe really differently in uh, in relation to what what they are saying some people some people with really breathy voices well they, their utterances will be shorter because they run out of air much faster uh, if you're really small maybe the same thing will happen there or maybe you will compensate by by a really efficient phonation so that that very little air is lost in in every in every pulse, but um, but uh, so so I can't say much about correct and and, uh, and incorrect. I would say uh, I mean mostly for in in conversation at least uh, utterances are fairly short, and people use a very small uh, proportion of their lung capacity uh, when when speaking. So. So, um, I mean, if you, if you, at the end of something you're saying, no, uh, realize that I have to continue for a little longer, you usually have the reserve capacity to, to do this. But, but uh, of course, if you, if you go below your resting expiratory level, it will become more uncomfortable. And eventually you will, you will start noticing on the quality of your voice that that you're sort of pushing out the last of air from <laughs> from 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 your lungs so um but 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 also i think it's i think it's fairly rare that that people uh when when they are speaking that people breathe because they are hungry for air so that that the that it's the ventilation of carbon dioxide and, and oxygen it's, it's not that's not the the thing driving breathing in in speech mm -hmm. but um but um yeah but breathing so, is is extremely flexible isn't it and it is also cultural i think uh, for example we are talking about uh, speaking in the exhalatory part of the uh, breathing cycle. But I know that in Sweden, you use words that you uh, speak while you inhale, like, <gasps> or something like that. Yes. <laughs> so uh, oh, in that yeah. sense, I agree with you that there is no correct or incorrect pattern. Also when, for example, I go to Pilates classes, I mean, the breathing they ask is completely, mm, 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 um specific to that task so um we, it's a, a fairly dynamic system so my question would be wouldn't you agree that instead of being correct or incorrect is whether it serves in an optimal way the purpose of communicating yeah i yeah yeah i i agree i mean you will you will uh you will meet people or and and especially i think children who have to stop speaking be, because they run out of breath but, <laughs> but that's rare in in adults i i would say um because it well it's if you run out of air the inhalation is so quick so it doesn't really disturb the, the flow of speech much I, I think that's what's happening all the time and and uh, but but um what what i what I do think is that it would be really interesting, well, picking up on the Pilates thing there, it would be really interesting to look at, at uh, breathing patterns and uh, the 
gases in in blood how 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 much more carbon dioxide I do you have when when speaking a lot than compared to when when you're silent for example and uh, what happens with the oxygenation in the blood I, I would love to to try some exercise physiology uh, labs and, and maybe looking at breathing exercises or yoga exercises involving breathing and those kinds of things I'm, I'm not sure I'm not sure that's something I can motivate on, on my scientific side, but, but it would be very fun to, to look at. Yeah, uh, would an oximeter do that? Would, would an oximeter measure the levels of oxygen with, the, with that? And then you could correlate with the breathing patterns a person is, is mm. doing, yeah. right? Yeah, so, so a pulse oximeter would give us at least uh, the oxygen side, but it would also be interesting to see the carbon dioxide side of it, I think. That will be more uh, difficult, I think. Maybe, maybe that's that's more difficult, but it would be fun. It will be fun, right? And yeah. uh, sorry, I, I talk about again the pandemic, but <laughs> <laughs> but we are still in there. Although we are much better now, and the, the restrictions are being loosened in in the countries now with this Omicron variation of the virus. But I was going to ask you that the 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 in in human physiology. Uh, if you uh, use um, um, postures that uh, shorten your muscles, then your muscles become less flexible and less able to move. So with the face masks, uh, the sensation I have is that, and it is described in literature, that you cannot take as much air as you used to because you have a resistance in front of your mouth. So in terms of physiology of breathing, would that shorten up our muscles of inhalation and therefore interfere in the long term with our lung capacity, you think? I mean, I, I'm not sure. I, I guess it could go both ways because if you inhale against a, a larger resistance maybe maybe you're actually actually mm -hmm. exercising the the inhalatory muscles i'm but but i i'm i'm, I'm only speculating here but uh, but i mean uh, one thing that's that probably happens with with the face mask is that that uh, you will inhale more of your own uh, your own exhalation air there so so the uh and um with less oxygen and, and more uh, co2 and uh, this i guess will lead to a higher breathing rate for example and and possibly shorter utterances because of this and uh, and exhaustion I and, and exhaustion and, and maybe I don't know. Maybe maybe headaches if you if you wear them for a long. Oh yes, time. definitely. Uh, <laughs> I wear, definitely, I, I have that a lot yeah. when I am all day wearing a mask. It's terrible. Yeah. Anyway, but hopefully... aren't doctors wearing masks for 12, 14 hours in? Yeah, surgeries. but they don't need to speak. Oh. They don't need to speak as much as we do, as teachers or singers or voice teachers. I mean, uh, they don't. They just talk as, uh, sometimes here and there and there, uh, the saying, "Give me this, give me that, pass me this, pass me that." <laughs> during the surgery, then they take it but off. For, I mean, for, for speaking for pan... sure, but for, for the the breathing breathing purposes, uh... no. I I don't know. Maybe. I, I don't know if they train people to to make uh, deeper inhalations when when wearing masks. I, I guess that would solve some of of this. But but yeah, if you athletes, yeah. yeah, I think in athletes they 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 use masks, but is to be able to work, uh, not to be exhausted. Uh, uh, um, be, because of what we were just talking about, the breathing rate and all that, so to yeah. make to to be able to to uh, do the the effort they need, even in in non optimal conditions. Yeah. So, um, uh, well, it's an it's I guess we don't know yet. Maybe someone is doing research over that. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. But, but Mauro, I don't know if notice. Uh, you, you've noticed Matthias has talked about already differences between children and adults. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
uh, have you noticed uh, differences in the breeding patterns of children, adults, female, male? Um, Can we, could you talk about if, if, if there are some kind of pattern? Um, I haven't really had um, made those comparisons in the lab. So we mostly had uh, adults and uh, in, in the lab. And, and then the, I think the individual differences are larger than the, the differences between, between males and females. That, that's, that's one thing we, we've observed. Um, so we've been able to pool the data from, from males and females in, in several studies because they just look the same way, basically. Mm. But, but with the children, I mean, the expected things would be things like uh, a higher breathing rate and, um, and uh, probably the, the, the thing we mentioned before with less, less planning in speech so that they run out of, of air more often than, than adults do. But, um, but, but I, haven't, I haven't done any, any, uh, any uh, studies in, in that direction, but... Uh, but but uh, we can guess they are higher in everything, higher in energy, higher in <laughs> breathing rate, higher yeah. in, in pitch. Uh, um, they are higher in everything. And as we get older, we kind of uh, get lower in everything. <laughs> <laughs> At least I talk to about myself, but I think it's the trend that adults, uh, younger adults have more lung capacity than older adults. And, uh, and also uh, between female and, and males, you saw that the patterns were similar, but the lung capacity is different, isn't it? Uh, yeah. I guess it's about 55% uh, higher in men as compared to women. I mean... Lung capacity has a lot to do with how tall you are and, and also, um, well, I guess, I guess uh, how tall you are, that, that's the most important thing. But then, then uh, other aspects of your, uh, of your body. But, but so in general, of course, males, statistically, males will probably have larger lung capacity, but then you will have the, the athlete swimmers who who can have huge lungs and then <laughs> then, uh, then uh, tiny phonetics professors with <laughs> really small lungs and... <laughs> so. I mean you have a wonderful lab there Matthias I, I must congratulate you uh, I had the honor to visit your lab and see all the assets you have. Uh, uh, not just in terms of recording equipment and measurement equipment, but also facilities like an anechoic chamber. And, and um, so um, in all your assets, the assets you, are, uh, uh, you have available around you, which one you think uh, is a must to have in a voice lab? Can I only pick one? <laughs> no, I mean, no, you pick as many as you want. <laughs> if someone uh, is starting a voice lab, like yeah. we did in some two years ago or when something like that, what would you recommend the person to have? I mean, I guess the, the thing that, that, I mean, any phonetics lab or voice lab or, uh, well, will need is... Um, is some kind of a low noise uh, omnidirectional microphone so with with a fairly flat frequency response i, I think that would be the, the the first item to to get so that you can make high fidelity recordings of, of voice and and capture also very weak sounds with the microphone and and uh, well without the no thermal noise of the of the, the microphone disturbing your your recording so that that's that's uh, that's the first thing and of course some sound card and stuff but but then then how you continue from there i guess that depends on what you want to do in the lab but but i guess a lot of people will also need uh, some 
some tool to calibrate the microphone so that you can do calibrated SPL measurements, for example. So such a gadget would be high on the on the list, I think. But um, what else? I mean, um, where do you have your heart on? <laughs> uh, I, I mean, also if. If I didn't already have them, I, I, I would actually want one of those contact microphones fairly soon. And especially since they are not so expensive. So, but then, then um, um, also something, if you want to combine signals like the normal microphones with the, maybe you want to do subglottal pressure measurement pressure measurements you want to do you want to record the EGG through this through the same interface and have this in, in sync with, with the audio signals well those breathing signals that that we've been using a lot uh, an, an audio interface that can handle DC signals that that's also I, I think I, I know that you have one of those in in your lab but that's also something I would get early on, I think, because it's such a hassle to, to record things with different, um, on different machines and then try to synchronize, to get signal, sy synchronize those signals. That, so if you can get that for free, that's, that's also, yeah. But then, I mean, after that, there are lots of tools that, that are useful. I'm, I'm, I, th I think I would get an oscilloscope, an old school oscilloscope, so that you can easily monitor various mm. uh, slow signals that, that you have there. Um, really useful. Yeah, yes, really, really, without, really useful. I yes. mean, uh, it was a wonderful thing for us uh, to be able to talk to you and to Stan Turnstrom and everything when we were setting up our lab because we bought more DAX data. And without yeah. that, it will be very difficult to, to synchron see what we were getting with our uh, physiological signals. Yeah. So, um, so you, and, and you, you will always need that and you need it for troubleshooting and for, well, all kinds of, of things. So, and then along the same lines, but, but this is really uh, cheap equipment, but things like cable testers, that's that's also- I love that, I have to yeah. get one. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I mean, when when you when you notice that a that, uh, recording is, is ruined because because of a bad cable, that, that's so annoying. So, um, yeah. Maybe a test signal generator, if, if that's not... Well, you have one in the Mordax uh, thing. That, that's also very good when, when you just want to make sure that that the signal flow is through but the... But you see, I don't have your, your kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, gene of engineer. <laughs> <laughs> so um, engineer. that would be more tricky. <laughs> Yeah, but 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 I mean, you you often want to do things like, um, is 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 this is this input on my card? Is it is it active? And uh, and uh, if you then you can just plug a cable and send in a, a sine wave there to make sure that that everything's working. That's yeah. Wow. That's why you are a professor, in, yeah. and, and I'm Just not. Just insert a fine wave, and that's okay. Yeah. And speaking about that, also it's good to mention here that you run a course on uh, uh, voice analysis in in uh, Stockholm University, an online course. Do you want to talk more about it? I mean, yeah, we we are trying to develop uh, a couple of courses for uh, that are. Um, relevant both for speech and, and voice research. And the first one we did was on, on data collection methods and, and uh, well, precisely those things like, how do you do a calibrated SPL recording? And how do you capture subglottal pressure uh, in, in a good way? So, and um, we tried to cover, it was mostly on acoustic and physiological signals, but there were also some other 
uh, aspects there. But but in the in the um, in the second course we gave um, that that was more on on if you have those data collected already, how do you how do you analyze them? How uh, what kind of what kind of signal processing do you need to to do th things like uh, identifying the uh, onset of inhalation and uh, onset of exhalation automatically and such um, such um, tricks and and um, we tried to do uh, most of of the processing in in uh, Prat and with Prat scripting as well. So, so I, I think I think it was good. We we will probably make it slightly different next time. But but um, those are courses that that um, I would have liked to to take when when I studied. But but now instead uh, I learned this by by uh, taking part in in teaching them. So yes. <laughs> and I will. I had the privilege of being at your first course, not on the second one. I didn't know that would be one like that. Otherwise, I would be there as well. Uh, and you know that we have also one at UNED run in Portuguese, Spanish, and English. Um, so you you cannot compete with that. I think the, the audience for these kinds of courses it must be immense, isn't it? No, uh, I was just joking. I mean, your courses are brilliant, really. Uh, um, so congratulations on that. And um, um, let us know uh, which ones you will mm -hmm. have in the future so that we can also spread that information and, and make our community of voice researchers that include the teachers of singing, logopeds, uh, uh, a year and nose and throat specialists, phoniatric, phonetricians, yeah. etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, interested in in doing this analysis, which you were describing. Yeah, may, maybe I should mention in relation to those courses that that um, uh, one one reason why why it was so fun to do them was that we did them together with Sten Tanström and Svante Granqvist and other people in Stockholm so so um, amazing team <laughs> that will yeah. be uh, everybody I, I think especially the teachers perhaps but but we, we learned a lot uh, you know what I am very glad that you exist because <laughs> uh, there are no many uh, research labs in Europe that are interested in studying uh, uh, well there are there are some but there is you know the reference when I was a younger researcher and I was doing my, my PhD in 2003, something like that, the reference was KTH. Yeah. And it still is a reference, but now Stockholm University is also referenced then uh, in Germany with uh, uh, Michael Dillinger, but although they're studying more modeling and biomechanics and biophysics of, mm. of voice, uh, so it's good to know that these research labs um, on voice and speech and language exist because um, there are many people that want to know more about um, voice and, and research from, from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Good, wonderful. So Mauro, do you want to, to ask another question? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, Professor, you also have studied communication patterns in different languages. And within a language, uh, the contours of different accents, uh, what was the most striking findings you have encountered yeah. comparing these different languages? Well, um, one thing I, I could say there is that, uh, I mean, we have, when we've been looking in turn, for example, turn-taking patterns, then, then we've been, one study we had, I think we had Dutch, uh, Swedish and Scottish English, for example. So different languages, but not that different. They, they were, mm -hmm. were all European languages at, at least. And, um, and in other studies also, well, sort of, looking a little bit at, at um, voice 
quality aspects of, of turn taking. We had Slovak, uh, American English, and the Argentinian uh, uh, Spanish. And uh, in both those studies, uh, I think you could say that the, the similarities were greater than the, the differences. We didn't really find anything that looked like cultural differences with, with respect to turn taking. Um, People used non-modal non voice in approximately the same way in those three languages. The, the, the intervals between offset of speech of one speaker and, and onset of speech of, of the next looked similar in, in, uh, in um, those three Indo-European languages we, we looked at. So we haven't really found any um, any clear cultural differences but but i guess that if if we would turn to languages that that are much more different different i i mean maybe japanese for example that that there would be differences here but we haven't really we haven't really done that because uh, we before before starting to look for cultural differences we wanted to to understand the well understand the system in in one language basically but um, so and then uh, you said something about pitch patterns and or i mean that's of course a, a big part of of different regional variants of of a language and and language differences and and so on but but um, so there 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 are huge differences clearly uh, and and i i can't say that that i have a good overview of of all the relevant aspects there there, there will be so many many different <laughs> uh, uh, things to look at but but um, yeah. But but for instance, so uh, taking that on embarking on that uh, uh, cue, um, there are lots of of studies in psychology uh, that in speech they only measure. Sorry if I'm hurting someone. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> mean fundamental frequency. So yeah. uh, from your perspective, what could be uh, more valuable measures of of uh, uh, speech patterns uh, in studies that involved, you know, um, human behavior. I mean, I, I think for many of the things, many if if it's pitch patterns that that you're looking at, then then I think it's the movements that that are interesting. Uh, it's not. The, I mean, if I have a, a mean pitch level of what 115 or something. That's not very informative for for anything. I, I mean, I I might find out that if I have a cold, my my average pitch will go, mm -hmm. go down a bit. But but again, not not very interesting. So finding ways of of describing the the dynamic the, the dynamics of pitch, I, I think that that's where you can do the interesting things. And then so dynamics, and of course, I mean, as all the auto segmental phonology things the timing of movements relative to to the the phonetic segments that that's also very important i mean you hear a pitch movement much more clearly if it's inside a vowel than than if it's in some very weak voiced uh, consonant for example and and the, in the when there's a when there's a lot of spectral change like in transition from vowel to consonant it will also be much more difficult to to hear that this this is a downward glide or or something. Maybe you will hear such such a movement as a jump rather than as a glide if if the the amount of spectral change is, is big enough. But so but but um I, I think in, in many ways I, I think it I think it's good to study curve shapes of of things rather than medians or or means of, mm -hmm. of speakers yeah well thank you for your advice i think uh, everybody should hear it <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> yes, yes. Uh, do you have any final question, Filippa? Um, well, we are approaching our uh, one hour, and uh, yeah. um, I think we we call it a day. Uh, <laughs> but once again, uh, we we say many thanks to you, uh, Matthias, Professor Matthias Eldner, for being with us, and. Um, we will be in touch, as you know, because I've promised I will send you some things that I didn't yet, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but let's let's keep in touch, and I, I will keep you informed about uh, about these these courses when when they happen. So wonderful! Thank you so much. Have a wonderful time in Sweden. Thank you, and um, hope to see you soon. And uh, thanks for inviting me here. So. And I hope the next time you come to Spain, we'll be in person, not in Zoom. Yes, yes. I hope so, so too. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor Matthias Hedner. Thank you, Filippa. Bye-bye, we'll Mauro. Go back you. in the next United Voice Lab Live. Yes, we'll be soon. Thank you.